what I was really interested in was what does it mean to practice responsible AI in a mature way? So I started with, let's say you do fairness. What does it mean to practice fairness in a less or more mature way? Reliability and safety, right? Um, so so that's that's how I started. But, you know, the beauty of qualitative research is that you often get answers to questions you didn't even ask. And mm-hmm. so as I was asking, um, you know, we were asking our, our interview participants about, you know, fairness. What have you seen in terms of fairness being practiced in a more or less mature way? They were like, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. It's not about that. It's about culture. It's about leadership buy-in. It's about collaboration. And so this is what these experts, right? Oftentimes, you know, like data scientists, this is what they wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about these facilitating conditions without which you cannot have an advanced or mature responsible practice. And this is how we ended up with dimensions for the maturity model in three categories. And so we ended up with kind of a pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid is this organizational foundations, right? What are the the foundations that the organization needs to put in place um, to facilitate um, the practice of responsible AI? And so um, at the end of the day, you know, we we've seen responsible AI and 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 other movements as well um, start bottom up. You know, sometimes uh, you see you see things where there's a, a bunch of concerned employees and they start thinking about something and they start working about some on something. And that's wonderful. But you cannot have a sustained, integrated, mature, responsible AI practice if it's grassroots only. Right. You have to have that leadership buy in. Right. And by leadership buy in, I mean not only declaring that responsible AI is important, but actually incentivizing it with resources. Okay. And so I think right now, uh, with with all the, the media coverage that we have about artificial intelligence, it is a little bit easier, it seems, to convince leadership that this is something important, right? That responsible AI is something important. But really a strategy that has worked um, out well for us is really pull up uh, news articles, you know? <laughs> Look at this article. Do, do you want to be, you know, an article in New York Times about our company, <laughs> you know, showing this, that, or the other, right? right. And so, right. Um, you know, that, that's that been something where, you know, um, by people people seeing news coverage, they realize mm-hmm. that this is actually important and mm-hmm. um, that it might cause reputational damage um, and it might cause, uh, it, it it showcases the real, the real harms that could happen to people in society. So, so that's mm-hmm. long answer uh, mm-hmm. to get to, to the actual answer to your question. Uh, that is one of the strategies, like just really um, um, showing examples, examples that are, can be scary, examples that can be shocking, and examples that are relevant to the context or the industry that the company is operating in. And, and let's be clear, I mean, you know, when when you talk about responsible AI, you're not just talking about, you know, uh, fairness and, you know, uh, data, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, AI security, but you're talking about you know, something as practical as setting the right expectations um, with the with the users and making sure that we are telling them, um, you know, giving them the ability to to edit, you know, AI AI's output, empowering them and and making sure that they understand where you know the pitfalls are with your current technology. It's not an abstract concept of just, uh, you know. Uh, not that fairness is 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 abstract, but it, it is it has very practical application and implication for your for your users for your customers, right? At the end of the day, you know, in in any product or development, right? Like we know the importance of UX. At least we know it in theory. But I think what has happened is that UX practitioners got somehow left behind because of the rapid technological innovation and people with, you know, maybe the the engineering and data science background going at a fast speed and UX practitioners not being able to catch up. But what we make clear in the Hacks Toolkit as well is that actually not any one discipline can do this alone, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And developing user experiences with AI 
requires deep interdisciplinary collaboration. So we show that, you know, for, for many of the guidelines, for example, many of the guidelines for human AI interaction, let's take the one that we just talked about, the, uh, guideline two, about making clear how well the system can do what it can do, right? So, you know, this is a communication problem, right? You need to communicate efficiently to users somehow and you know, engineers and data scientists are not necessarily trained to to do that, to communicate effectively through an interface or through an interaction or user experience. And they're not necessarily trained in, in evaluating the effectiveness of that communication through user research. On the other okay. hand, UX alone cannot get that done because you need the information about the system, about the, you know, error rates, confidence uh, rates, mm -hmm. right? Um, accuracy, the types of errors that it's going to make. And then you need to translate that from data science into, into an interface or an interaction that people can relate to without like overwhelming them with, with numbers and statistics that most users, you know, are not going to be able to interpret or really care to spend the time to interpret. Right. And so you can see how this cannot be done by either, by either discipline alone. Right. We mm -hmm. absolutely need um, UX if we want to get, you know, to, to build these kinds of effective uh, user experiences with AI, but then we can't just put something on the interface without having a deep understanding and communication and interaction with the engineers and data scientists, right? It's a job of translating um, uh, from, from that to, to, the, to the users. Um, and so, yes, UX is, is as important as ever, uh, but again, not one discipline can do this alone. And this is particularly, particularly salient in responsible AI. Because if you think about responsible AI, Responsible AI is about how could people get harmed, right? right. It's a people problem. And so right. it's not a technology problem that can be solved alone with technology, right? right. Uh, it's right. A, we, could, we talk about responsible AI being a socio-technical problem, okay? Right. And so how are you going to understand, you know, what could go wrong, who could be harmed and how? right? Mm -hmm. um, without actually talking to people, without actually engaging with the uh, experts in, you know, the people people, right? <laughs> um, well, so, you know, the way I like to think about it, it's about asking repeatedly the question, what could go wrong? Mm -hmm. Who could be harmed? And how? Mm -hmm. Now, we know that the types of harms resulting from um, AI uh, apply not only to direct users, but also other bystanders or stakeholders, as well as society at large. So who could be harmed, right? That's a broader question. And this is where I'm struggling also. I'm struggling uh, as an aside with the term user research, because um, we really need to expand and understand how our AI um, uh, powered products impact not only direct users, but um, other stakeholders. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out a new name, um, but I can't quite come up with a with a catchy enough one, right? <laughs> so then we know that the harms that could result from from AI, right? You can you can kind of categorize them along um, some of these uh, principles um, that many companies have adopted, right? So there's uh, fairness and inclusiveness, reliability and safety. Um, transparency, accountability, privacy, and security, right? And so these principles begin to make responsible AI a little bit more concrete. And then if you look, for example, if you look at um, Microsoft Responsible AI Standard, which um, if, you, if you do an online search, you can find it, you'll see that there are specific goals around each one of these principles, right? So around fairness, there are three goals around reliability and safety. And so those further break, break those principles down into more tangible things. But one of them, you know, one of them that... Um, you know, we can talk about is is uh, the trans transparency. And so there are many, many layers of transparency, but one of them is about being transparent to uh, users and stakeholders. And actually, transparency can often be implemented in the UI, right? So if you look at um, one of the previous projects, um, I mean, it's not dead, it's out there. It's the <laughs> Hacks Toolkit, right? The Human uh, AI Experiences Toolkit. And that is a, a set of tools for planning 
uh, the, the experience of interacting with AI, planning your user-facing AI product. And uh, that is grounded in a set of guidelines for human AI interaction. And so there are some guidelines, especially the first two ones, that are directly related to transparency. Um, so if you, uh, if you again, you could search for the Hacks Toolkit or the short URL, URL is aka.ms slash Hacks Toolkit, H-A-X Hacks Toolkit. Um, so the first two guidelines make clear what the system can do. Okay. Um, and so, but that has also a reverse, make clear what are the system capabilities, but also limitations, right? And then the second guideline is about make clear how well the system can do what it can do. Basically set expectations, set realistic expectations up front that no matter what kind of AI system you have, it will make mistakes. And so the more you empower users to understand the types of mistakes it will make and maybe how frequently, the better the user is capable to actually employ that AI product or feature in um, in an efficient uh, manner and, and, and being empowered, right? And so people ask, well, but I don't have, you know, space on my UI to write full paragraphs about, you know, <laughs> and you definitely don't have to. Like if you look at the Hacks Toolkit, you will see that we have a lot of examples and we have patterns for how you could implement these guidelines by right, showing rather than telling. Um, so you'll see you could get a lot of ideas there about how you could do this type of transparency in the UI without actually, you know, writing long paragraphs that nobody would probably read anyway. What is one takeaway? in, you know, 30 seconds, one minute that you would want the audience to leave. So um, the first thing that comes to mind um, is, um, again, a little bit spicy, and I might be very wrong, but I think this entire generative AI you know, thing is highly overrated. <laughs> um, and there I go on, on, on video saying this. Um, I think, you know, we've gotten overly excited very, very early. I think it's a very mm. powerful technology and it's important to understand it. Um, but it's also important to to manage um expectations and um try try to be try to be realistic. Um so anyway, that's not perhaps the main the main takeaway, but the main uh takeaway that I would like people to to uh, remember is is to have that confidence that UX really matters, that UX mm -hmm. plays an important role in AI and in responsible AI, and that even though once again it's you know we've we fought this fight before as a field, right, and mm -hmm. and it seems we might need to fight it again. But as long as we do our due diligence in, in learning, right, so that our own understanding and expectations are managed and realistic with regards to AI, I think we can, we can uh, I hope that one takeaway is to have that confidence that, yes, um, there is a role for UX and it's a critical one.